Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This 5-Minute Mystery is being brought to you by... Hold on. I am tired of you coming up with stupid sponsors for these 5-Minute Mysteries. What would you have me do then? Tell people the truth. They can't handle the truth. Then lie to them. Hence, the stupid sponsors. Oh, now I get it. The usual peace and quiet of a small college town was disturbed one day last summer when Inspector Brass received a phone call from Dr. Jonathan Brown. Professor of Chemistry at the University. Inspector, you've got to come right away. Something terrible. My wife has been poisoned. I'll be right up. Don't disturb anything. I'll do as you say, Inspector. You'll be right up. Very soon. Goodbye. Goodbye. Doc, I want to rush out upstate. Grab your stuff and hurry up to Dr. Brown's place at 1412 Church Avenue. Says his wife is dead. Poisoned. How did you know, Dr. Brown, that your wife died from poison? Being a chemist, I am well acquainted with poisons and their effects. As soon as I saw my wife, I knew that her physical appearance could only have been the result of poison. Do you uh, keep any drugs or poisons around the house? Yes, I do. I sometimes work in my laboratory in a cellar. Mm -hmm. Members of the uh, household could get to the stuff rather easily, then. Yes, I'm afraid so. I haven't been too careful with just the nurse, the cook, and myself around. I understand that your wife has been ill for quite some time. Yes, ten years. She was an invalid for the past two years. We've had Miss Calphorn as her constant companion and nurse all these years. Are uh, you Miss Calphorn? Yes, I am. She's been very wonderful to my wife. Took care of her better than a mother cares for a child. Did everything. Washed her, dressed her, tasted her food to make sure it wasn't too hot or cold or badly seasoned. Bread to her. I've been very grateful. Is that right, Miss Calphorn? Yes, sir. Mrs. Brown trusted me completely. She was my friend. It was a horrible accident. Uh, what'd you find, Doc? Poison, just like her husband said. Acted within a quarter of an hour. Mm-hmm. Anything else? No, not right now. Huh? See you in the morgue. So long. So long. Uh, Miss Calphorn, were you with uh, Mrs. Brown all the time? Yes, sir. While I was feeding her, she was seized by a spasm and gagged and became discolored. I've been nursing for 20 years, and I've seen the symptoms of poison before. I gave her something to counteract the poison, but it the poison acted too quickly. When did uh, Dr. Brown finally get there? By the time I arrived, my wife was dead. I don't blame Miss Calphorn. She did the best she could. I think it was a terrible accident. Well, Dr. Brown, I disagree. It wasn't an accident. Miss Calphorn, would you be so kind as to accompany me to headquarters? You're under arrest for murder. What made the inspector so sure that it was murder? In a moment, we'll know, but first... Have you ever noticed these guys aren't very excited about their loved ones being dead? Yes, Dr. Brown seemed unmoved by his wife's demise. The nurse showed some remorse, and according to the inspector, she's the murderer. Wrong. Do you really think she did it? I mean, I like Nurse Kelform. She seems like my kind of person. I can see that. She is conniving, evil, and downright not nice. Just like you. Don't you think you are being judgmental? Don't you think you picked a bad role model? Only if she is guilty. And now, back to our story. Rather unusual, Miss Galphorn. You didn't care who was suspected, including yourself. But you made one slip. You agreed with the doctor when he said that you did everything for Mrs. Brown, including tasting her food. If the food was accidentally poisoned, you would have died too. Therefore, Mrs. Brown must have been poisoned during or after her meal. You talked her into believing she was poisoned by the food. So she would do anything to save herself. That is, take your so-called remedy. 
Only it wasn't a remedy. It was poison. Well, that was pretty straightforward. Yes, I am afraid my dear Nurse Kelfhorn is a murderess. Why do you think she killed Mrs. Brown? Well, they were short on information, but my guess is that it was greed. If she had been her nurse that long, she probably was to be compensated. Probably true. Oh, wow. You didn't slam me today. You are right. Wrong. You are an idiot. Is that you said? Hello, and welcome to the podcast. We have a full show this week with stories for you and some about you. Our featured story is one of revenge and stars that monster about town, Boris Karloff. Then we travel back to 1944 for a history lesson about the codebreakers of World War II. So, let's get it started with this from Stephen King. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Audible has sponsored the show now since July of 2019. We have reviewed more than 140 audiobooks, and the list keeps growing. Did you know that Audible has over 200,000 books available? And a lot of those are included in the free catalog. Audible is amazing, and it is the perfect companion to Ron's Amazing Stories. If you like this podcast, you're going to love Audible. So what am I listening to? Fairy Tale by Stephen King, narrated by Seth Numrich and Stephen King himself. Every once in a while in history, there's an author that comes along that is, well, special. I don't have to tell you that King is one of those. He is a legendary storyteller, and he's returned with a new tale that goes into the deepest well of his imagination. In Fairy Tale, a 17-year-old boy inherits the keys to a parallel world where good and evil are at war, and the stakes couldn't be higher. For that world or ours. Charlie Reed looks like a regular high school kid, great at baseball and football, and a decent student, but he carries a pretty heavy load. His mom was killed in a hit and run accident when he was 10, and grief drove his dad to drink. Charlie learned how to take care of himself and his dad. When Charlie is 17, he meets a dog named Radar and her aging master, Howard Bowditch a recluse in the house at the top of the big hill, with a locked shed in the backyard. Sometimes some very strange sounds emerge from it. Charlie starts doing jobs for Mr. Bowditch and loses his heart to Radar. Then, when Bowditch dies, he leaves Charlie a cassette tape telling a story that no one would believe. What Bowditch knows, and has kept secret all his long life, is that inside that shed is a portal to another world. Our clip for today from Fairy Tale does not really give you an inkling of what this story is all about. What it does do is show you how well the story is read and what a masterful storyteller King is. I get asked all the time if I pick these promo bits each week. Truth is, I do not get to pick them. Here is a bit from very early in the book, and I think you're going to like it. It was named the Frank Ellsworth Bridge, after a hometown hero who died in Vietnam. But the locals just called it the Sycamore Street Bridge. Sycamore Street was paved nice and smooth on both sides, but the bridge deck, 142 feet long, was steel grating that made a humming sound when cars went over it and a rumble when trucks used it which they could do because the bridge was now rated at 60,000 pounds. Not big enough for a loaded semi, 
but long haulers never used Sycamore Street anyway. There was talk every year in the town council about paving the deck and adding at least one sidewalk, but every year it seemed like there were other places where the money was needed more urgently. I don't think a sidewalk would have saved my mother, but paving might have. There's no way to know, is there? We lived halfway up the long length of Sycamore Street Hill, about a quarter mile from the bridge. There was a little gas and convenience store on the other side called Zip Mart. It sold all the usual stuff, from motor oil to Wonder Bread to Little Debbie Cakes, but it also sold fried chicken made by the proprietor, Mr. Eliades, known to the neighborhood as Mr. Zippy. That chicken was exactly what the sign in the window said, the best in the land. I can still remember how tasty it was, but I never ate a single piece after my mom died. I would have gagged it up if I tried. One Saturday in November of 2003, the town council still discussing paving the bridge and still deciding it could wait another year, my mother told us she was going to walk down to the Zippy and get us fried chicken for dinner. My father and I were watching a college football game. You should take the car, Dad said. It's going to rain. I need the exercise, Mom said. But I'll wear my little red riding hood raincoat. And that's what she was wearing the last time I saw her. The hood wasn't up because it wasn't raining yet, so her hair was spilling over her shoulders. I was seven years old and thought my mother had the world's most beautiful red hair. She saw me looking at her through the window and waved. I waved back, then turned my attention to the TV, where LSU was driving. I wish I had looked longer but I don't blame myself. You never know where the trap doors are in your life, do you? It wasn't my fault, and it wasn't Dad's fault, although I know he blamed himself. Thought, if only I'd gotten up off my dead ass and given her a ride to the damn store. It probably wasn't the fault of the man in the plumbing truck, either. The cop said he was sober, and he swore he was keeping to the speed limit, which was 25 in our residential zone. Dad said that even if that were true, the man must have taken his eyes off the road, if only for a few seconds. Dad was probably right about that. He was an insurance claims adjuster, and he told me once that the only pure accident he ever heard of was a man in Arizona who was killed when a meteor hit him in the head. There's always someone at fault, Dad said, which is not the same as blame. Do you blame the man who hit Mom? I asked. He thought about it, raised his glass to his lips, and drank. This was six or eight months after Mom died, and he'd pretty much given up on beer. By then, he was strictly a Gilby's man. I try not to, and mostly I can do that unless I wake up at two in the morning with nobody in the bed but me. Then I blame him. Mom walked down the hill, there was a sign where the sidewalk ended. She walked past the sign and crossed the bridge. By then it was getting dark and starting to drizzle. She went into the store and Irina Eliades, of course known as Mrs. Zippy, told her more chicken was coming out in three minutes, five at the most. Somewhere on Pine Street, not far from our house, the plumber had just finished his last job of that Saturday and was putting his toolbox in the back of his panel van. The chicken came out, hot and crispy and golden. Mrs. Zippy boxed up an eight-piece and gave Mom an extra wing to eat on her walk home. Well, I'm pretty sure I don't have to tell you that this segment doesn't end well for Charlie's mother. King's storytelling in fairy tale soars. This is a magnificent and terrifying tale in which good is pitted against overwhelming evil. And a heroic boy and his dog, must lead the battle. Early in the pandemic, King asked himself this question. What could you write that would make you happy? As if my imagination had been waiting for the question to be asked, I saw a vast deserted city, deserted but alive. I saw the empty streets, the haunted buildings, a gargoyle head lying overturned in the street. 
I saw smashed statues of what I didn't know, but eventually found out. I saw a huge, sprawling palace with glass towers so high that their tips pierced the clouds. Those images released the story I wanted to tell. Well, the result of that question that Stephen asked himself gave us a fairy tale. Now, if that appeals to you in any way, head to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can have Fairy Tale by Stephen King for free. Here's what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook in 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This also gains you access to the included catalog, which is updated constantly with new titles. So, to download your free audiobook today, Go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Thank you, Audible. These are your stories sent by you for you. This time we have another shadow story, and this one is really strange. On first read-through, I thought it was just a dream and even thought about discarding it. But the question that was asked at the end piqued my interest, and it is my hope that you guys will weigh in on it. It comes from Tyree Beverly, who lives in Detroit, Michigan. He has titled his story, And It Just Hung There. Many years ago, we lived in an old house. We had many spooky encounters while there, and this is one of them. One night I awoke sometime in the wee hours in our dark bedroom. I saw movement to my right and turned my head and saw a dark silhouette of an arm sticking straight up out of the bed. The hand was bent at the wrist, dangling, with fingers fanned out and limp. The arm and hand were slowly waving back and forth. I assumed it was my wife, perhaps dreaming. I watched, somewhat disturbed, at the strange behavior and motion. I reached out my hand to gently grab her arm to wake her up, and to my surprise, there was only air. The silhouette slowly faded away. I was startled and frightened. I called out her name, and she sleepily answered me. I felt the covers, and her arms were both completely underneath. I laid there in silence, and it took me quite a while to get back to sleep. The very next night, my wife woke up and looked over to see a silhouette of me sitting up in bed next to her. She asked me what I was doing, waking me up to respond to her. When she heard my voice come from the bed instead of the head level of the sitting figure, she jumped out of bed screaming. Needless to say, Neither of us slept any more that night. Ron, I don't understand. I mean, one person having that experience would mean that it was probably a dream or hallucination. But two different people? That just isn't right. Have you, or any of you hearing this, ever heard of or experienced this? Tyree Beverly, Detroit, Michigan Well, Tyree, I, for one, have not. I did a bit of research, and I came up with a few people with the same experience. One person called it demon arms, and the other ghost appendages. I have to say, I like the second one better. To everyone listening, I say this. Have any of you experienced anything like Tyree experienced? Please let us know. Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you want to share, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com. Click on the story submission banner, leave your story, give it a title, and please tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story comes from the master of horror and suspense, 
Boris Karloff. Did you know that for a very brief time he had his very own radio show? It was titled Creeps by Night. It was broadcast on the Blue Network February 15, 1944 through August 15, 1944. That's only six months, and for a radio show, that's bad news. Now, you might think it was probably not very good. Crazy, but true, the reviews for the series was very positive. In fact, the showman's trade reviews said, and I quote, We were literally scared out of our skin while listening to The Strange Burial of Alexander Jordan, one of the very first episodes. Another reviewer had this to say, a suspenseful dramatization, well-written and acted. Well, with Boris at the helm, how could it be anything less? Creeps by Night provided Boris Karloff with his first full-time role on a radio program. He was the host and narrator for the show when it was launched. However, when production of the show moved from the West Coast to New York City, Karloff dropped the project and the show didn't recover. Too bad, too, because the series is really well done. Only five episodes remain, although some reports suggest that there are seven. And the quality of the recordings are abysmal. I restored the episode that you will hear today, and I'm working on the others to have on the podcast at a future date. The story that you will hear today is titled The Final Reckoning and presents a tale of revenge being a dish best served cold. It first aired on May 2nd, 1944. Bring you creep by night. The Blue Network presents the international star of stage and screen, the master of mystery, Boris Karloff, in Creep. By night. How do you do? This is Boris Karloff inviting you to join with us for another dramatic exploration into the unknown darkness of the human mind. Our theme tonight is revenge. We have chosen for you a story that plums the very depths of one of man's primary emotions. The eternal seeking of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is the story of a man who waited 20 long and heartbreaking years before the opportunity came to seek vengeance. But when it did, he stalked his prey with the cold and horrible stealth of a black panther. Night presents Boris Karloff as George Miller in The Final Reckoning. Our scene is the warden's office, the state penitentiary. A middle aged man, his shoulders hunched and his hair prematurely gray, stands before the warden's desk, clothed in an ill fitting prison made suit. His face is yellowed with the pallor of long confinement, but his eyes Set deeply in dark shadowed hollows are bright and clear. Looking at him, the warden speaks. Well, I wish you'd reconsider, George. I don't like to see you walk out of here in your condition. I'll be all right, Warden. I'll be a fool. You've just gotten over a bad case of pneumonia. Why not spend an extra week or so in the hospital? Let Doc Reed put you back on your feet. My time is up at noon today, isn't it? Yes, but we're glad to. That's when I'm leaving. The moment that noon whistle blows. You're in no shape to travel. Look at you. You're still sick, man. Definitely sick. I've been sick for almost 20 years, Warden. Ever since those iron gates out there closed behind me. 
I've waited a lifetime for the cure. Planned for it. Now I'm going to get it. Oh, you're just being stubborn, George. I don't understand it. You've been a model prisoner in every way. In the entire history of the penitentiary, only three men have had life sentences commuted. And you're one of them. And yet, in a matter that concerns your well-being, you act like an obstinate fool. Why? Because I've got something to do. Something very important. <laughs> What's more important than your health? The thing I've got to do. Wait a minute. Are you going to do something that uh, might land you back in here? Is that it? Don't worry, Warden. You know, come to think of it, George. There's something I've always wanted to ask you. Something personal. Go ahead. In all the years you've been here, why have you refused to see visitors or mail? Why did you completely cut yourself off from the outside world? Well, it, it all boils down to this. A man ages a lot in 20 years. His voice changes and his way of talking. His features change. He becomes an entirely different person. Especially in a place like this. Just knowing that you're hemmed in by four walls. It does something to you. Something... Well, that's the answer. It's no answer at all. Yes, it is. I didn't want anyone to see me age. To see the changes that were coming over me. The way it is now, the George Miller who is walking out of here at 44 is nothing like the George Miller who was brought in at 25. They're two different people. No one outside this prison will ever recognize me. Hmm. And is that what you want? That's exactly what I want. Why? You've got nothing to be ashamed of. You've paid your debt to society. There's another debt I have to pay to myself. It's been owing for a long time. Uh, I don't like the way you're talking, George. What's behind all this? Twenty years, Warden. The best part of my life. A minute ago, you asked me to look at myself. I don't have to look. I can feel it down inside. I'm an old man. An old man at 44. Self-pity is a bad thing, George. I'm not pitying myself. I'm thinking about what brought me here. You've got the record right there in front of you. I said I was innocent then and it still holds. I'm innocent now. That's a closed book. Why not let it stay closed? Because there's an unfinished chapter still to be written. Remember, you haven't served your full term. You'll be on probation for five years. I remember. I've had a long time to think it over. Hmm. Incidentally, while we're at it, there's one more thing that's been puzzling me. You'd better hurry. It's almost noon. Six months ago, when it seemed pretty certain that your commutation was coming through, you made a strange request. You asked to be relieved of the job of running the prison library. A job you'd held as far back as I can remember. And he asked me to assign you uh, as an apprentice to the prison barber. I granted that request, but I I wondered about it at the time. Would you care to tell me why you suddenly decided to become a barber? I thought it might be a good idea to learn a trade. That's not true, George. Well, the noon was hot. That means I'm a free man, doesn't it? Yes. Good night, Orton. Take care of yourself. You haven't answered my question, George. You mean, why did I suddenly decide to become a barber? Yes. I told you. I wanted to learn a trade. And I told you that's not the truth. You're right, Warden. It isn't. No kidding. Yeah, got his sentence commuted. The they know? He does. He better start moving. Charlie, this is Duke. I just got your call. 
George Miller's out. Wonder what Ace will do. You want to hear something, honey? George Miller's out. Boy, would I like to see Ace when he gets the news. George Miller's out. 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 It's true, Ace. They can use his sentence. He got out yesterday. Uh, what did I tell you? I spend a hundred grand a year on smart lawyers. And where do I get my information? From a hothead. A barfly. But Ace. Oh, sure, sure. I'm out of my mind. I don't know what I'm talking about. George Miller's dead. He died in prison ten years ago. Eh? Well, that's what they told us. Who told you? Our sources of information. Your sources of information. <laughs> don't make me laugh. Now, look at And I'll get out before I lose my temper. You don't need that out, I said. His sources of information. Barry, get me a drink. Oh, Ace, honey, don't get yourself all upset. Shut up. Ace, Shut up and stay out of it. None of your business. Is that a nice way to talk? Who is this George Miller? I said it's none of your business. What's that? Just that doorbell. I'll answer it. Wait a minute. Now what? Don't open that door. You'll find out who it is. Oh, you heard me. Find out who it is first. Okay. Who is it? Who is it? No answer, Ace. Yeah. Miller, trying to trick me. Ace, why is the sheet? Take it easy. Keep your voice down. Now listen to me. In case anything happens, he threatened me. I had to protect myself. Do you understand? Yes, but... Ace, what are you doing with that gun? Never mind. You just follow orders. All right. I'll open the door. Slowly. Ace, I'll I'll Open it, I said. <laughs> Nobody here. What's that on the floor? What is it? What? A dead rat! outside his door. Oh, that was yesterday. I mean today. What about today? You got another one? Yeah. It came in a box. In the mail. Holy smoke. Ace is ducking out of town. He's scared stiff. Where's he going? Up to his hideout in the mountains. Take the car out of the back, Chuck. Okay, boss. What about the bag, Dave? Chuck, I'll bring them. Come on. How long have you had this place in the mountains, Dave? Oh, a couple of years. Mm. Sure is good looking. Hell, what did you expect? That summer resort? All I want is a place to hold up. Play low, the boys get Miller. There should be a bell around here. Somebody in the house? Don't you ever get tired of asking questions, Vera? They told you on the way up as a caretaker. Ah, the bell doesn't work. Well, if you ask me, this is all a lot of crazy. Nobody's asking you. Hey, Danelli's running away from a stair bomb. Right down. Somebody's coming. Good evening, Mr. Danelli. Ah, oh, good evening. Is everything all set? Yes, sir. The master bedroom is ready. Now we'll go right up. This is Miss Carroll. How do you do? Hello. You're not the same man with hair last year, are you? No, sir. That was Ed, but my cousin. He's been ill, and I've been substituting for him. My name is... is Walter. Okay. Bring up a couple of brandies. We'll be upstairs. Yes, sir. I sure hate to be holed up in a place like this for the rest of my life. Well, just say the word, and Chuck will drive you back into town. I think he's made it, honey. Well, stop it. Right now, I'm not in a kidding mood. Okay. Now, there. What's wrong with this room? Well, it's... Very nice. Honey, a face, four closets, double exposure... What more do you want? Nothing, darling. Just sit here. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Close the door. Since when were you bashful? Now, look, Vera. Get one thing straight. I came up here to play safe. There's a guy gunning for me. Until he's out of the way, I'm not taking any chances. You are trying to say, What I don't get is why you're so afraid of this George Miller, whoever he is. What did you do to him? Yeah. I guess I sent him up for a behind bars. Did you? You know, one of these days, Billy, you're going to ask the wrong question. I know. It's none of my business. 
That's the ticket. Did you tell me one thing, Ace? What? Those, um, dead rats. When we found outside the apartment door, and the one that came by parcel post in that little wooden coffin. What do they mean? What do you think they mean? I don't know. It's got something to do with George Miller. Yeah, yeah well, you guessed right. Miller's trying to get me jittery. He knows I've got a bad heart. Planning these things to tell me he thinks I'm a rat. I don't want if he has anything to do with it. Hey, Tom. Now, don't worry. I'm safe up here. The boys will get Miller. Yeah? It's bought and served with your brandy. Okay, okay, come in. Uh, just, just put the tray down on the table. Yes, sir. Will that be all, sir? I guess so. What about our luggage, Dave? Oh, yes. Did my man bring the bags up? Yes, sir. They're in the hallway, sir. Well, bring them in, will you? Yes, sir. So no water. Yeah, I'll take it straight. Where shall I put the bags, sir? Oh, just set them down any place. Yes, sir. Will that be all, sir? Yeah. And uh, don't forget to lock up. I won't, sir. Good night. 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 Oh, that yes or no, sir, routine is going to drive me nuts. It talks like one of those fancy movie butlers. Looks like a zombie. Here's <laughs> a drink, honey. Yeah. How about you? No, I better get the bags unpacked first. Oh, the stuff will be wrinkled. Well, here's how. I needed that drink. <sighs> Oh, maybe I can relax. Sit down and take it easy, honey. You know, it's not going to be so bad staying up here for a week or two. Hey, how do you open this bag, eh? Which one? Yours. Black leather. Oh, there's a little gadget on the lock. Just press it and it snaps open. You got it? Uh-huh. And we'll get a good rest. Ooh. What's the matter? Look. Look at that. What? Another dead rat. <laughs> Talk, you double-dealing skunk, or I'll suck your skull. Hey, believe me, I, I didn't do it. I'm a sorry. Talk, I said. Spell it. I, I ain't got nothing to spell. Well, listen, Chuck. No. I know your kind. No. I know them from way back. No. You tell your mother for cash on the line. No. George Miller got to you. No. He paid you to slip that dead right into my suitcase. No. 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 Get up. I don't trust you either. I don't trust anybody. You're all a bunch of blood-sucking double-crossers. Boy. You heard me. You'd like to see me dead, wouldn't you? Get out of your mouth. Oh, get out, both of you. No. Get out, I said. Get out of the house. Let's stay out. Yeah, who is it? It's Walter, sir, with your brandy. Oh, bring it in. This is the last bottle, sir. Yeah, put it down. Yes, sir. <laughs> Will that be all, sir? Yeah, yeah, that's all. It's Walter, sir. Come in. I thought perhaps you'd like something to eat, sir. It's been three days since you've taken any solid food. Yeah. Three days. I brought an omelette and some toast. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Walter. Quite all right, sir. Hey, wait a minute. Yes, sir? You were pretty nice to me, Walter. Thank you, sir. Yeah, pretty nice. And I'm the kind of a guy who don't forget. I don't forget if a guy's nice to me. And I don't forget if he stabs me in the back. Neither do I, sir. Come in. I'm sorry to disturb you, sir. Ah, it's all right, it's all right. Come on in and close the door. Yes, sir. What do you got there, Waller? Well, I thought now that you're feeling a little better, sir, that perhaps you'd like to be shaved. It's been almost a week, you know. <laughs> yeah, don't tell me you're a barber, too. I have been a barber, sir. Well, I could use a shave, I guess, all right. If I may say so, sir, I think you'll find it very refreshing. Okay, go ahead. Where do you want me? The chair you're sitting in will be all right, sir. I'll get some warm water in the bathroom. You know, Walter, I've been thinking. When I go back into town, I'm going to take you with me. Yeah, I could use a man like you. That's very kind of you, sir. I like people like you around me. People who don't ask questions of getting your hair. Take care of what you're supposed to, and that's the end of it. 
I try to keep my place, sir. <laughs> you got the right idea. How will I do? Lean back? In just a moment, sir. I'll have to fasten the strop to the back of the chair. I want the razor good and sharp. <laughs> You'll need it sharper this year. Yes, sir. You must have been wondering about me these last few days, Warren. No, sir. Not particularly. You mean you wouldn't like to know why I've been hiding out here in the mountains? Sure, you must have a good reason, sir. Yeah, you can say that again. Someone's gunning for me. Gunning for you? Uh huh. Somebody trying to get me. Guy named Miller. George Miller. The name sounds familiar. He got a life sentence for murder about 20 years ago. He has quite a story out of the papers. He killed a girl. Did he? That's what the jury thought. They gave him first degree with a recommendation for mercy. That saved him from the chair. What did you think? Well, I think about what? Lean back, sir. I'm almost ready for you. Hey, isn't that razor sharp enough yet? Not quite. I haven't used it in some time. What did you think about George Miller's conviction, sir? Ah, what's the difference to what I thought? The jury cooked his goose. Did they? Yeah. Oh, come on, come on. What are you going to shave me get to it? I'm ready now. Lean back, sir. I'll soap you up. Okay. I assume this... This George Miller is out of prison now. Yeah. Got a commutation. Hey, you sure you don't need a lawnmower to get this beard off? I can do very well with a razor, sir. You know, I'm going to feel like a new man when you get through. Yeah? A completely new man. <laughs> ah, you're a funny guy, Waller. You talk like a college professor. I've had a lot of time to read and study in the past 20 years. A lot of time. Yeah? That's enough soap. Now just relax, sir. Does the razor pull? Nope. It was all right. That's fine. Nothing like a good, sharp razor. Yeah. Now, don't move. It's rather difficult shaving you in this chair. If you move, I may cut your throat. That's not funny. It wasn't meant to be funny, Ace. What did you say? Sit back, Ace. One slip and you're finished. You're a dead rat. George Miller. That's right. It's been a long time, hasn't it, Ace? George. George, you wouldn't tell me in cold blood, would you? This isn't cold blood, Ace. This is hot blood. Heated for 20 years. That's how long I've waited. Feel how sharp the razor is. No. No, George. Be careful. It doesn't take much to split a throat from ear to ear. You know that, George. George, I'll give you anything you want. Name your price. You couldn't meet it. Only one thing can pay for those 20 years. George, I've got a bad heart, you know. Yes, so I've heard. Oh, well, I'm asking for a break. Did you give me a break when you framed me and set me up for life? I figured you'd beat the rap. I never thought they'd convict you. Then you admit framing me. Yeah, yeah, but I never figured you admit that you killed a McGuire girl because she hate you too much. Because you wanted her out of the way. Yeah, yeah, but that's I... enough. It's more than enough. I'll feel the razor on your throat. Cutting. No, George. No. Cutting deeper. Down. Deeper. You said you'd be a new man when this was over. But you're wrong, Ace. You're only a dead rat. Who is it? It's Jerry. I've come back. Come in, Miss Carroll. Oh, hello, Walter. Is Mr. Janelle... Oh, 
Very ashamed. Ace, darling. I couldn't stand being away from you. I had to come back. I, I couldn't... What? What? Are you afraid of something? I'm afraid not, Miss Carlin. Why is he something to care? Why is I staring that way? Why does he move? He can't move. He's dead. Dead? Oh, no. Walter. Yes, he's dead. And my name isn't Walter, Miss Carroll. My name is George Miller. George Miller? George Miller? Yes. Then you... You killed him? No, Miss Carroll, I did not kill him. You don't see any blood, do you? But it's dead. He said he was dead. I'm afraid I played rather a gruesome joke on him. You see, I was shaving him with a very sharp razor. After I told him who I was, I held the back of the blade, the dull side, against his throat. <laughs> As you know, he, he had a bad heart. Unfortunately, it, it couldn't stand the strain. You murdered him? You got the chair for this. You're wrong, Miss Carroll. Quite wrong. Ace Janelli died of a heart attack. That's what a medical autopsy will show. You caused it. You brought it on. That would be very difficult to prove. I figured this out so carefully, Miss Carroll. I paid with 20 years of my life for a murder I did not commit. And now there's nothing the law can do to me. A one that I did commit. Creeps by night have just brought you Boris Karloff in the final reckoning. Be with us again next Tuesday night at the same time over most of these stations when Mr. Carlos will present another weird mystery of the mind, The Hunt. Now, you might think that this was not an original story. Well, it was in 1944. In fact, perhaps it inspired such movies as The Fugitive or The Shawshank Redemption. Maybe a bit of a stretch, but who can say for sure? William Henry Pratt, better known by his stage name, Boris Karloff, was an English actor who was primarily known for his roles in horror films. He portrayed, most famously, Frankenstein's monster in Frankenstein, 1931, Bride of Frankenstein, 1935, and Son of Frankenstein in 1939. His best-known non-horror role was as the Grinch in the animated television special Dr. Seuss, How the Grinch Stole Christmas in 1966. It is said that Boris took his stage name from a mad scientist character, Boris Karloff, in the novel The Drums of Jeopardy. That is not true. That book was not published until 1920 and he was already using his stage name by then. Karloff always claimed that he chose the first name, Boris, because it sounded foreign and exotic, and that Karloff was a family name from his Slavic roots. One verified reason for the name change was to prevent embarrassment to his family. His brothers were all dignified members of the British Foreign Service, and he was considered the black sheep of the family. Karloff donned the monster makeup for the last time in 1962 for a Halloween episode of the TV series Route 66. As part of the story, Boris Karloff, Lon Chaney Jr., and Peter Lorre met to discuss whether their old monster costumes they used in films, would scare a TV audience today. Boris Karloff was truly a special actor who graced us with some of our greatest tales and horrible nightmares. 
He spent his retirement in England at his county cottage named Roundabout in Hampshire village of Bramshot. He contracted bronchitis in 1968 and was hospitalized. He died of pneumonia on the 2nd of February, 1969, at the age of 81. That's exactly 53 years ago on the day that this podcast was released. How about that? Yes, it is our amazing stories. But just what does that mean? We have segments for your stories, one for strange moments in history, and even one that plays clips from the golden age of radio to take us back in time. So what makes this segment different? Our amazing stories looks at people who did amazing things. So sit back and listen to this incredible tale. Perfectly dressed and groomed to dash off to a meeting, Ruth Bourne sits in her North London home and modestly explains how she helped save Western civilization one letter at a time. Bourne was 18 years old in 1944. She had just finished her training at the Women's Royal Naval Service when she was assigned to SDX. What's SDX? she asked. SD is special duties, and X, well, we can't tell you, was the reply. Soon she found herself at Bletchley Park, which was, at the time, Britain's code-breaking center. Bletchley Park was once the country home of wealthy Sir Herbert Leon and his family. By 1938, the mansion was for sale, and the government code and cipher school needed a safer home. It was 50 miles from London, close to roads and railroads. It was refitted as a center to decode messages produced by the infamous Enigma machine, which was a complicated German encoding device that resembled a large, overgrown typewriter. The Poles had cracked the Enigma in 1931, but when war broke out and the codes were changed every 24 hours, it was evident that more effort need to be brought to bear on it. And so, to Bletchley, came an assortment of mathematicians, military experts, historians, bankers, musicians, chess masters, and even people who did their crosswords in ink. Huts sprang up on the grounds where the code breakers worked, sweltering in summer, freezing in winter, and in a haze of cigarette smoke. Chief among the codebreakers was mathematician Alan Turning. He invented the Turning Bomb, a device that turned the letters produced by the Enigma into legible German. With its rows of wheels and dials, it's tempting to call the bomb a prototype computer. But in fact, it was an electromechanical device that carried out a systematic search to find combinations on the Enigma. There were over 150 million possible settings to choose from. Meanwhile, Bourne and her mates learned that they would be doing very special work, unspecified work. They were told, You won't be getting any promotions or special pay. Hours are very antisocial, and once you're signed in, you can't leave. Secrecy is the name of the game. They signed the Official Secrets Act and were told that they would be breaking German codes. It only took one person to give the game away, Bourne said. There were big posters up, careless talk cost lives, and the walls have ears. She and her mates worked in shifts in a huge room containing 12 bomb machines. The windows were blocked up so nobody could see in. We didn't know whether it was day or night, she recalled. Working in pairs, they attached wheels, connected plugs, and waited for results. If they thought they found a legible message, they wrote it down and gave it to a checker. We spent one day working on the machines and another checking the stops to see if they were good enough to send to the huts. 
where they were picked up by codebreakers and put on other machines, said Bourne. Workers at the machines had to stand, checkers could sit. I never heard anyone talk about the work they did outside the block, except one girl saying, Are you sitting or standing? At the end of every run, they pulled off the wheels, pulled out the wire brushes with tweezers, and put them on the racks for the next run. The codes changed at midnight, sometimes sooner. You had to be very accurate, recalled Bourne. You had to make sure the brushes weren't touching each other to make a short circuit, and you had to make sure that you got your drums in the right position. The hardest thing was plugging up, so you didn't get the plugs bent, and also you got the right letters connected to the right letters. Shifts were 8 a.m. until 4 p.m., 4 until midnight, one day off, then midnight until 4 a.m., each with a half-hour meal break. The last shift was called the relief shift. However, Bourne said, none of us were ever relieved except when it was all over. Meanwhile, they had usual military duties, which included scrubbing barracks and kit inspection. Still, life wasn't all grim. There were concerts, a tennis court, Scottish country dancing, and a chess club. One of the code breakers put on a production of The Marriage of Figaro. Trucks took them to London to the stage door canteen in Piccadilly and to the theater, where they would collect autographs from such stars as Vivian Lee and Michelle Redgrave. Bourne and her co-workers never knew what the messages contained. One codebreaker learned that the Jews were being processed for concentration camps. Another intercepted a message to the German quartermaster complaining that the army-issue underpants split when the wearer sat down. One received news of the Normandy landings, of which Winston Churchill said, No single operation out of the war was so dependent on Bletchley as the Normandy landings. Indeed, without the work which was done there, there is no way the landings could have gone ahead, let alone succeeded. Motorcycle couriers took the translated messages to a radio station where they were transmitted directly to the war room by radio. As many as 35 or 40 bikers might come through the gates every hour. Churchill could read Adolf Hitler's mail before he did. It was estimated that the codebreaker's work shortened the war by two years. At the end of the war, Churchill ordered the machines destroyed so they didn't fall into the wrong hands. Bourne and her mates were delighted to do this, happily attacking them with soldering irons. We didn't love those machines, she said. Well, that's it for this edition of Our Amazing Stories. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any ideas for stories for this segment or want to write one of your own, please let me know. I would love to work with you on the project and want to hear any ideas that you might have. Use the contact page on the main website and we'll get it done. Thank you for listening to Our Amazing Stories. Okay, that was episode number 577, and that's a lot of podcasts. Today, I want to say thank you to Tyree Beverly for sharing his story with us. It truly was amazing. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. Bye.